This is July 3rd, 9.02 p.m. This is strictly for documentation purposes, retention, etc. It's not for nobody else's ears. Thank God for the timing on this phone, the records, and Facebook, definitely. I wanted to go to the library and do what I normally do, which is write all of this down in my notes section and then make it private for future purposes. But, you know, the powers of B closed the fucking library out of fear that people have a heart attack when they see me type all this shit off the top of the dome. And, you know, basically uh, doing away with their game, in which I don't give a fuck to impress or try to make somebody believe something. My shit's safe and documented. But uh, this, this little short uh, talk, I guess, is about the chapter that I read today in full. I sat down at the table and read the whole fucking thing. It's a place in northern Arabia. It's called Dumat al Jandel. And it's located in northern western Arabia. So I learned a little bit more about the map. Like I say, I know the geography of it, but as far as like, you know, different areas of various regions that are further delineated and given titles and names and shit, I learned a little bit more. Now in northwestern Arabia they got a town or a region or a province rather called Abu. Lightning flashes, not flashes, but firecrackers. People of the government. People do people are doing that shit on purpose to try to block out my voice. Hey, whatever. Anyway, it's a uh, province called Tabuk in northwestern Arabia. But like directly north of this fucking province is another province called uh, Al Jauf or Al Jauf today, A-L hyphen J-A-W-L. It was not a province as far as the name that's given today back then, but this is where this place called Dumat Al Jender or Jendel existed at. So in going into this uh, chapter, just like every other chapter, you got like different authors that give their versions of the story, so what you got to do is you got to use your own mind. You got to analyze what's more than likely the case based off uh, stories and their testimonies or testimonials and then put the shit together. So that's exactly what I did. So I'm going to try to make this precise because there might be a little bit more that I'm going to add to it that's outside of the read. Anyway, so the place uh, Dumat Al Jandel, it was basically like a little settlement. In my mind, I think it's a small settlement. And the people that live there are also, uh, you know, they share like a companionship with another tribe in Iraq called the Banu uh, Kal B tribe. But I'm going to put that on hold for now. Anyway, they were like a Christian group of people. And the head of this settlement was a guy named Yudair uh, Abdallah Al Malik. So after Muhammad had, like, conquered these other areas, even more so north than that, that I mentioned in my last uh, recording, such as um, um, uh, Al Jarba, um, Al Akra, um, Makna, which is also south of this, because Makna existed or exists in the province of Tubac today. Uh, Ayla, which is in southwestern Jordan, in the Aquaba region, and damn, it's another one that starts with a T. I just forgot because of the fucking firecrackers. Um, I'm not looking at no notes or nothing like that. I never do. So uh, it's called, um, damn, um, hold on, wait, 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 Tabuk, Tabuk, basically, the town Tabuk, which is also within the province of uh, Tabuk today. So that's in northwestern Arabia also. So that's the chapter that I had read prior to this, as well as the chapter prior to that, which is very fucking short when he's talking about two places in Yemen that he had been to, which is uh, al Jurash and what's called Sada in Western Yemen, and then another place called Tabala. But like I say, going forward with this chapter, okay, Muhammad basically continued his conquest. All right, this didn't have anything to do with him hearing about these people trying like to assemble a coalition against him, such as the other towns that I had just named. So he sent like one of his, I call him a general, only because, you know what I'm saying, he 
like before this latter brigade when they fought in uh, Mecca, when they invaded Mecca. Uh, his name is Khalid uh, Ibn al Walid. He has sent that guy to uh, do Matt al Jandel. Now, this is basically what happened. They, when he went there, he took a brigade with him, and then they defeated the people there. Not only did they defeat the people there, but they also captured their leader, the guy that I had just named, uh, you dare, um, not you dare, I'm just uh, UK dare, UK dare, Abdallah al Malik. And then they brought him back to the Prophet Muhammad. All right, when they brought him back to the Prophet Muhammad, he was basically forced to convert to Islam. And then after that was done, proceed, or not proceeding, but after that, uh, you know, the episode or whatever, Muhammad had wrote a letter, basically a message. And he sent it to the people there in Dumat El Jandel. And the, base, the letter or the message basically was telling the people about the terms that they will have to live under now that Muhammad is going to uh, dom not necessarily dominate, but uh, annex them into the other provinces as well that he had overall. I don't know if I should mention it all. I guess I will, such as uh, Taif, Mecca, Kabar, Fadak, Tang, Wadi al Kura along the route, which is basically west of Fadak. Um, Tabala, as I mentioned, Al Jurash, and of course Medina. So the terms that they were under is basically like this. He told them, like, okay, anything except for like running water that you guys have in your city and palm trees is basically uh, our possessions now. So your irrigation systems and all of that that you drink water through, you can have that. But as far as, like, your horses, your horses belong to us. Uh, the land, the entire fucking land, actually, the entire land within itself, because this was an oasis. Also, I got to talk loud because it's a firecracker. Also, land outside of this oasis that he referred to as, like, a wasteland or a desert. You know anything about an oasis? Oasis is basically like a green patch of land within a dry desert-like region. <laughs> so, also they're called wadis also, but it's basically like a, a oasis. So anything within this particular town, outside this town, within this oasis, and as well as outside of the oasis, now belongs to Muhammad. As well as the fucking, um, the weapons that they had. He mentioned defense and offensive weapons. All of those things now belong to the prophet. And then he said as far as like that cattle, uh, that graze the land, they would have to kind of like split them up into, I guess, like certain sections or territory within this town itself. That way he could throw like an adequate stipulation out there as far as like the number of animals that would belong to him that he would pick up and also add to his overall treasury, et cetera. And um, let's see, that he add to his, 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 his treasure and then the rest of them they get to keep or whatnot. So this is like a, 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 a sadak or a stipulation that they had. He also, um, I don't want to say confirmed, but he basically said like they would have to convert to Islam just like their leader had when they captured him. And not only, only that, they would have to like demolish all of their idols that they had under them. So that was a stipulation that he threw out there and also uh, he told them, like, okay, in due time, basically, that he's going to send his, his ministers or whatnot to teach these people how to properly pray, as well as uh, distri distributing their land, like the, the, the zaka, as they call it, basically, that that was also uh, forthcoming or eventually going to take place. That's what he warned the people about. So um, following that, let me see, I think um, – yeah, that's basically uh, the entirety of what happened as far as that. But um, UK Dur Abdallah Al Malik did kind of break the covenant later on. But before I go into that, 
I want to go further into this little history of the place that he's from. Because in the literature that I read, you know, like I say, when you're going through various authors, you know, you get a little bit of differences as far as the story. Uh, I believe that UK Dur Abdallah Al Malik lived within that area somewhere. Because what they say is like, okay, it's a guy named uh Waqidi fan. He says that um one day UK Dur Abdallah El Malik had ventured police pulling up, had ventured uh north with some of his brothers, I guess, and they went to go visit his uncle. The place that they had went to was um I think it was I think it was Al Kufa. It could be Al Hira. I want to say, no, it was Al Hira. That's what it was. It went to Al Hira. Now, Al Hira used to be called Demat Al Hira. Demat means stone. So what had happened one, one, uh, eventually is that, like, when they were on their way later on from fishing, they stumbled upon this group of ruins a ruined city, basically, and the people that was with them had decided to rebuild this city. Now, I'm going to pause right there for a second and give a little bit more context behind this. The city, the city is kind of significant because during, like, Neo-Assyrian times, I'm going to say, like, about 100 years before that, you know, that used to be, like, a part of their territory, and it was called Adumatu. So this is dated to like around uh, 845 BC. So I say 100 years before the Neo-Syrian Empire, because Hyglyph Palesa didn't come into office until 747, not 745 BC, 745 to 727 BC, before his brother basically uh, took office after the person that came into office after him. I'm talking about Sargon II, but I'll leave that alone for now. Anyway, so. Um, yeah, so he eventually find this little, you know, city of ruins, and then he rebuilt the shit, and that's why he named it after al Hira, which, again, al Hira had the first part of the name first, Dumat al Huraya, who, damn, Dumat al Hira. So he named this city Dumat al Jane Dell. All right? Now, that makes sense to me because... It's a uh, tribe that lived also in Al Alhira, and like I said, it was, it's, it's the tribe that I mentioned earlier, the, the Banu Kalbi tribe. And so, like, they were basically, uh, to give a little bit more background about them, they also were kind of like spread throughout the Middle East to various parts. Now, supposedly, 55 percent of Syria was inhabited by these people, Northeast Syria as well as Northern Arabia. Now, as far as the terminology is concerned, those areas, as far as at least Lebanon, downward to North, Northern Arabia, used to be referred to as Syria, not just the land going north. Syria itself, the one that, you know, the little land that's next to fucking, um, uh, that's uh, west of Iraq, east of Turkey. And then you got fucking Lebanon, and then you got... Uh, Israel beneath that, and then right next to fucking Lebanon and Israel, you got Jordan, Jordania, as it used to be called, which is also separated by the Jordan River, including the, the Dead Sea also. But anyway, that little, that little area along the Levant, especially from Lebanon downward to Northern Arabia, used to be referred to as fucking Syria. So I was reading about this, right? I'm trying to make sure I understand this shit carefully. Now, they was like the northeastern part, and then they mentioned uh, southwestern Arabia. That used to be considered Syria. So 50, and also it was like an area that was arid and like semi-desert-like. So as far as the longitude is concerned, when you look at northern Arabia, also the Levant, up until Lebanon, that's what you call the semi-desert area. When you go into, like, Central Arabia, you know what I'm saying, it's more desert-like. When you head north from Lebanon, it's also less 
fucking desert life. So it makes sense that they will be talking about Lebanon, basically, down into Northern Arabia. It's similar to Mali. You know, like, Mali is split into, like, three different geographical sections. It's the same as that. And so 55% of Syria was basically inhabited by various people that can be considered, like, um, a part of the Banu Qabi tribe, which I'm going to make a little further distinction in a second, but I'm going to go further and talking about, like, other areas that they inhabited as well. Uh, also in Jordan, now, first off, 85% of Jordan was inhabited by people that could be classified as the Banu Kabi, but not just that. I'm going to say why in a second. So we're talking about southwestern Jordan, so definitely the Aqaba region, as well as uh, southeastern Jordan, which is of a larger, or as far as... Um, I guess you could say as far as, like, diameter, you got a larger amount of land mass there. But I'm also thinking about, like, land that could be inhabited also. And that's not just desert-like. You know what I'm saying? Kind of like uh, along the same lines as uh, Lebanon. Anyway, so also in Iraq, for instance, in southern Iraq, you had groups that can also be considered a part of the Banu Kabi tribe, but not just that. I'm going to get to it in a second, at a place called Samawa, Iraq, which is at the southern portion of it, also south of some basically some major key towns, especially when talking about the medieval period, such as uh, al Hira, which I will go further into later on, al Kufa. And all of these are along the Euphrates River, all right? Euphrates, not the fucking Tigris River. Both of these rivers start in the Persian Gulf, and then they kind of like, uh, I guess, I guess uh, run downward, but northwest in the direction, in the direction northwest, but run downward northwest into Syria, all right, which also used to be a part of uh, Mesopotamia far as where these rivers end at. So anyway, so people in Samawa is also a part of this tribe as well. All right. So I think I got like pretty much all of the places. And I do kind of wonder like, okay, is that part of Iraq as far as during medieval period? Was that also considered a part of fucking uh, Eastern Jordan? You know what I'm saying? I kind of wonder about that. So anyway, that's where all these little tribes were, um, or, or various tribes within these regions could be considered a part of the Van Kabi. Now, this is why I think there's a distinction before I go first. <clears throat> the, okay, first off, let's go to Lebanon, for instance. You got a tribe called the um, Banu Amila tribe. And, you know, based on, like, the chapters that I read prior, they basically lived in Lebanon. Oh, by the way, I just got to throw this in there. I'm going to keep that shit to myself. Anyway, in Lebanon, the Banu Amila tribe, they basically live there. And uh, the Banu Jut Ham tribe also live in parts of Syria as well. Again, because, it's because at least from Lebanon downward into northern Arabia was considered Syria as far as the language that these people used back in the day. And I don't think that's flawed, what I'm saying, because it's just like um, – Sudan, you know, you got the country of Sudan that's south of fucking Egypt, but the whole, the whole of um, the Sahara Desert was also called Sudan at a certain time as well. So it makes sense to me that the, the language would change, and then back in a certain time period, these people referred to, referred to certain areas as such, such as Syria. So you got the Banu Amila that lived in Lebanon, and then you got the Banu Jut Ham, who also lived in northwestern, or you can find parts of them, parts of those people in northwestern Arabia, uh, Syria, which means along Lebanon as well, because they were also companions to the Banu Amila group, and then later on, they also inhabited Egypt, all right? But the Banu Jut Ham, as well as the Banu Amila, 
could be considered a part of the Banu Kabi tribe, but only because similarity as far as ancestry is concerned, and not just those people. You got the people in uh, southwestern Jordan and what they call Aquaba, the Ela people. You know, like their chief during this period was a guy named Yuhana Ibn Ruba. Those people also, because see, southwestern Jordan was also considered an area that you'll find like people that's also classified as the Banu Kabi. So therefore, the people of Ela definitely fit such a category or classification as well. Uh, the people, as far as the Makna people, which was in um, the province of Sabak, as it is called today, they also would be considered a part of this group as well. But the big factor is there was never no fucking um, monolithic like confederation to where like all of these tribes had some type of covenant with each other to where you could say like it's similar to that which was officiated by Muhammad in 622 AD. For instance, let's take the Khazraj tribe. You know, you had like a sub-clan of these people that were Jewish, the Saida tribe. So like if they had got, let's just say like they went to, um, let's say they made it as far as Al Kufa or something, and they had an issue with somebody and they got attacked. And that means even though this is a Jewish fucking tribe for the poor clan, for the most part, they shared a covenant, covenant with Muhammad. And a part of this covenant is that if, Anybody within this agreement gets attacked. Other people that share or adhere to this covenant would have to come to their defense. All of these tribes that I mentioned in these various places that can also uh, be placed into the category of the Banu Kabi tribe, it was not the same thing. And the reason why I say that, and I ain't going on a tangent, it's going to make sense in a second. The reason why I say that is because earlier on, before Muhammad sent Khalid ibn al-Walid to invade Dumat al-Jandel, these places that I just mentioned were all not necessarily attacked, but when Muhammad had went to uh, northwestern Arabia, you know, he eventually got the chance to meet with all of these sheep. As I said before, they only named one, which, is, which was Yuhana ibn Rubar. But because all of these different places, and I'm going to mention them again, fuck it, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Ela, Makna, Tubak, or Tabuk, um, um, Al Jarba, and Al Akra, not up, uh, but Al Akra. All of these fucking places agree to Muhammad's terms. I can go into like the differences in the term and all that, but shit, it's uh, 23 minutes, and like I said, a lot of people, try, whatever, 23 minutes. So. When Muhammad had went along this conquest, I feel like if all of these various tribes had some type of fucking monolithic confederation going on, oh, please, please touch, had some type of monolithic confederation going on to where, like, they had a covenant similar to that of Muhammad. When Muhammad, not necessarily invaded, because, like I say, these people didn't put up a fight. When he gave these terms out there, they would have fought against him. Now, as far as that chapter is concerned, they did mention that supposedly he heard, and I think this is just like a historical embellishment, and I maintain that. Supposedly he heard that these people were assembling a coalition against him. But, you know, when he finally got clarity about it after he went to northwestern Arabia, Tabuk once again, he found out that that was not the case, but he still proceeded, all right, in annexing these other lands and giving out terms to these people, even though no fight ensued. So that means he was on the conquest himself. That's what I'm saying. And again, if these people had that much of an intimate relationship with each other, it would have been a fight against Muhammad. That didn't take place. You know what I'm saying? So I want to say that. Now, as far as Waqidi, he claimed that uh, Duma al Jandel was actually conquered in 626. Now, based on the logic that I just provided, that's also part of the reasons why I don't think that's the case. Now, as far as like uh, the name itself and what the name was inspired by, okay, as far as the people in Al 
uh, Hira, I think that may be true. Because Al Hira was called the match Al Hira. Hira. You know what I'm saying? And as far as the story that he gives, like in 2017, you know, it's obvious that you got like archaeologists that dig up shit and they also do carbon dating, which they didn't have back in the day. And this fucking town, uh, Dumat Al Jendel, you know, not only dates back at least 3,000 years ago, but based on like deciphering of uh, Syrian inscriptions on fucking stones and, and tablets and stuff like that, that particular site was mentioned in their writing, which means they were familiar with it, even though it was called by a different name 3,000 years ago. Again, um, Adumatu or Adumatu. So it definitely does exist. So for Wakiti to say that UK Dur, um, Abdallah El Malik, stumbled upon this land and then decided to rebuild it. To me, that kind of like coincides with facts as it is today. So I don't question that part. But as far as like um, Muhammad supposedly conquering these people, like what, uh, four years prior to, 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 to what the other authors assert, you know what I'm saying, as far as in that writing, I don't think that's true. First off, in 626, that's when the Banu and Nader tribe got ran off. You can say kicked off, and I'm going to say ran off. The land for violating the covenant, quote, unquote, <clears throat> that the that Muhammad and them had with them as well as other people as well. So when they ran up, when they got ran off the land, they basically went north, and they settled it in Kabar. Now, up until this point, nobody, excluding Wakidi, nobody, no fucking other author on the subject, all right? And I'm talking, when I say up to this point, I'm talking about, like, from that moment or that period in 626, which was in February of that year, all the way up to the present moment, as far as where I'm at in the book. Four years later at 630, they don't mention anything about Dumat L. Zendel uh, being fucking conquered. Now, you got to think, as far as me, I'm looking at it like, okay, if you go in chronological order, you got... Medina, as far as uh, those fucking areas of Medina that the Danu and Nader tribe under Huye Ibn Akta, you know, basically inhabited, when they got ran off the land, he, Muhammad, dished out these lands to Bilal Ibn Rabar and Azubair, all right? Now, after that, you had this little fight that went, went on. I'm not going to go into it. It's called the Battle with al Kandak or al Kandak. When, um, you know, these three factions, q tribe, the q tribe, and the Banu and Nader had basically linked up actually a fourth component that came later on, which is uh, the Kwe Nukwa tribe. When they all linked up and they tried to double team and, you know, invade Medina, but, uh, you know, the Medinians under Muhammad and his answers were successful because they built forts, et cetera. You know, you got 10,000 men, da, da, da. I'm not going to get into that. But the whole thing is that that occurred in 627 A.D., also February. So exactly a fucking year later after the Banu and Nader tribe got kicked off the land, okay? Now then, a year following that, that's when Kabar got invaded, all right? So that's exactly 628 in February of their year as well. Then a month after that, that's when they developed this treaty as far as between Muhammad and then the parties of two race. All right? So that's what? March of 628, a month later. Okay? Following that, goes to the next year. I mean, I mean, not, not the next year, but uh, later on that year. Okay? After Kabar had got annexed, then you had this treaty. Then that's when Fadak got annexed. And they didn't really put up a fight either. After Fadak, that's when um, um, uh, Wadi al Kura got annexed. After Wadi al Kura, Tang got annexed. All right? Then after them, uh, that's when, you know, parties that were under this treaty, you know, broke from it or whatnot. 
based on like two proxy tribes that went at it. I ain't gonna get it all into it, but you know the the Banu Baka tribe or Bakari tribe, excuse me, and the Banu Q Zaa tribe. When they got into it, blah 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 blah. Mohammed got mad. That faction there, they invaded fucking uh, Mecca. You know they basically destroyed the place. Blah blah blah. blah, blah, blah. Okay, after that, which occurred in um uh uh. Uh, damn. That same year, 629. I think it was 629. Or was it 630? 629. Okay, then that's when they fucking invaded Tai. Okay, after that, that's when they went south to fucking Yemen, to those two places that I named, such as Al Jurash in Western Yemen, and then uh, Tubala. Now, during this whole fucking conquest so far, because it's going to continue, why would you go south? If, okay, it's like this. It's like this. If Muhammad had plans on going northward and conquering various lands, which is a premise that I maintain regardless of what's written in this book that doesn't really add up as far as him thinking people were trying to gather against him in the north. I believe that he always had plans to land grab, basically. So if this actually occurred as far as Dubai Al Jandel is concerned in six twenty six, why would he go backwards to Yemen? Why wouldn't he continue that conquest northward? All right? And this is a single testimony, all right? This is like a uh 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 like a like a like a like a six to one testimony. Well one is six. Therefore, overwhelmingly, people say the opposite, which is that uh, Dumat Al Jandel was not conquered until 6:30. So I'm sticking with that, not just be, not only because of the quantity, as far as how many people attest to that, it's because of what makes sense to me personally. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, so uh, let me just make sure I don't lose. So yeah, that's what I think about that. Now, after that had happened. During, I, I'm going to say, um, UK Dur Abdallah Al Malik maintained the covenant or whatnot. But once Muhammad died, and then Abu Kaba, not yeah, Abu Bakr or Abu Bakari, I don't like to say Bakr, Abu Bakari, you know, became caliph after he was voted. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so this is going to be between 30. 632 and 634 A.D. The place that he was voted at was in Medina, and it was called Aqaba, all right? These people voted and put him in office and whatnot. But while he was in office, that's when U.K. there, Abdallah al-Malik, had decided to uh, abandon this covenant, basically through his actions. He didn't send a fucking letter or anything. He just stopped paying the sadaqa. All right. Now, the way it's written, it's funny because I know a lot of people just, I don't know. The way it's written, you know, I feel like I had to, you know, I caught on to what the fuck they were saying behind the words. Basically, it's like this. He felt like he didn't have to um, be obligated to this, to, to this stipulation that was placed toward his people during the lifetime of Muhammad. So he stopped paying, he stopped paying a sadaka, and then he went a step further, and then he went into the place called al Hira. And then he had like a building erected that he called Jamat. So when Abu Bakari found out about this, you know, based on word that these people was not paying their sadaka. So I guess like the mills, when I think about it, like a, a mill for people that collect taxes, you know what I'm saying? Like they were, when they would go there, um, I guess they would be turned away. And if, if, if you had like merchants, or people within uh, the Ma Al Jendel that had to personally make the journey, you know, to give away some of these uh, uh, goods or produce or a certain amount of animals or whatnot. If that was the case, then that means they stopped making those journeys. But under the order of the Kader, uh Abdallah Al Malik, either way, again. If that was not the case, and then uh, you had to send, or they had to send a mills to collect this, that means he turned their ass away uh, 
still. But either way, he still put a block out there. So when Abu Bakari found out about this, that's when he sent one of their generals. And like I say, I call him a fucking general only because, you know, when they uh, invaded Mecca, he was one of those people that led a brigade. His brigade in particular, I don't think they came from the north. I think that was Azu Bear's brigade that came from the north. Could be vice versa. But uh, I believe that uh, Khalid uh, Ibn al-Walid had came from the south when they invaded Mecca. And plus, after this whole little battle, he, because I read about him or whatnot, he participated in other battles also. So anyway... That's why I refer to him as a general, even though he wasn't the only one. But he's the guy that Abu Bakari has sent, all right, to deal with you, Kader Abdallah al Malik. So when he went northeast, um, he basically he, he not captured him, but he fought against him and they killed him, all right. Not only did they kill him. The little building that they erected in Al Hira, that was called Dumat, you know, they basically uh, made or gained possession of that prophecy. Now, I think that's fucking interesting too, because I know as far as like the Lakmir people, they also inhabited uh, uh, Al Hira. So I'm like, okay, is to me, I'm looking at it like this. Okay, Al Hira is basically the name of a certain fucking area, more than likely. Dumat al Hira is the name of a uh, 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 a town, you know what I'm saying, with forts and stuff like that. That's my understanding of it. Because so far, like I say, they don't say any, and being at the Lightness is always kind of like on good terms or partners with assassins. You know, I would think like if you invaded their territory as far as their lines, that would create more of an issue. It, it would engender more conflict. So Dumat al Hira had to be have been outside, probably within the region or close to it, or definitely outside of where the lack was centered at. But the building Dumat there in Al Hira, you know, uh Khalid Ibn Al Walid slash Abu Bakar basically annexed that. Okay? So then when he went back into well, I guess he was traveling back toward Arabia, but again, as far as the literature, they say he was going traveling back into Syria. So, of course, you got to pass through northern Arabia before you get to Medina. To Medina. But on his way there, that's when he attacked the people of uh, Dumat al-Jandel. That's what happened. Now, as far as UK Dur, Abdallah al-Malik, he had a brother. His name was uh, Hurayith. Or Hugh Ray Issa, or Hugh Ray Is, um, Abdallah Al Malik also. So that guy had to be converted into Islam, and then he was also placed as a proxy leader, all right, a substitute over the people there, so that Muhammad and them could continue their rule, and then they reverted back to the Sadaka that they had to pay. That's what happened. That's the story of him. Now. What I read first, I think, was fucking, fucking interesting. Okay, he had a daughter. Because there is, like, one author or a testimony that they mentioned as far as a, 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 um, when um, Khalid uh, Ibn al-Walid had went there to al Ira. Or, you know what? Yeah, he was ordered by Abu Bakr. But he was in another town, actually, but it was still like along the fucking Euphrates River. The town was called An Al uh, Tamari, T A M R. So I doubt if, 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 it's, if it's Tama. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's An Al Tamari. He was already there when he had got the order, which is, which is fucking interesting to me because that means there's a lot more to the story. But as far as like the essentials of it, he did capture that guy as far as UK there. Abdallah Al Malik, but according to this particular author, on the way back he also captured some slaves and whatnot. Then it's like a little fucking love story between a female named uh, uh, what's the other name Al Jody or something like that. Uh, Al Jody and and and, and, and Abdallah R Rahman and but you know based on the story I don't think it's fucking true. He's fell in love with her or whatnot. And then, you know, she caught a fucking disease and she became ugly. 
So he basically divorced her based on the traditional terms of a fucking divorce. That is completely obsolete to me. I think that's just extra. So I don't really, you know, follow that part too much. But anyway, the thing that I do think is interesting is that uh, UK Dur, Abdallah, Al Malik's brother, Hugh, uh, damn, Hugh Reed, damn, I think it. Hugh, 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 uh, Riata, Abdallah, uh, Al Malik, that guy, he had a daughter, right? So this happened later on, by the way. It was not like during the same period. But he had a daughter, and she had ended up marrying this guy named Yazid Ibn Muawiyah. That's fucking interesting to me and that's insightful because that guy later on had ended up becoming the caliph. And so he became the caliph when he was like uh, 33 years old, and then he died at 36. So he only reigned for like three years. So the time that he became caliph, this is and let me see, what was it, six, six from 643 to, wait, 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 this was 6, uh, 80 to 683. That's what it was. 680 to 683. Right? So he was, what, 33 when he became Khalif, and then 36 when he died. And he was also the son of the Khalif that came, uh, came into office after him. I'm not sure. It wasn't immediately after him. I don't think so. But he became he came into office after him, which is also his name is obviously Muawiyah. But the whole thing is, those people came from Mecca, as far as the roots, and they were considered a part of the Amiyah Caliphate. Now, being that he had married um, who 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 Raita, what the fuck his name is, basically Ukader's brother. Being that uh, his brother's daughter had married this guy, I feel like that's a keynote because they're not from fucking Mecca at all. They're from Arabia, but not from Mecca. You know what I'm saying? And it could be arguable whether they came from Iraq uh, uh, for the most part. I don't think so. Like I said, I think they had roots there as far as the people, the, the Banu Kabi people. I don't think they're really from Iraq. You know what I'm saying? I think they actually come from or live like that. I think like they're that stars like that immediate, immediate from a relative standpoint. Not just people within their family as they live, but their immediate family members, like predating them, probably come from that region. But I think UK there lived for the most part and was raised in northwestern Arabia. But anyway, uh, his niece didn't come from fucking Mecca. So I thought it was interesting that she got the chance to marry royalty. And you're talking about uh, Muslim. And she comes from a Christian background, even though by this point, by the time that she was born, <clears throat> she was born into a, a fucking Muslim province, basically. But still, I think that's interesting. That's basically all they said about her and Yazid Ibn Muawiyah so far. That's all they said about them. But I keep a note of that because I'm pretty sure it's going to become relevant later on as I go uh, further into the story. So, yeah, that's about it. Uh, I don't think I'm really missing anything else. I, I do want to say this. Um, when I was compiling all of this together, right, and I'm paying attention to what they wrote as far as, like, you know, what the authors have to say, blah, 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 whatever, and I'm putting this together carefully because I'm like, I want to make sure I'm on point. And I know I am so far, especially the geography, even though, like, they went further and delineating steps and volcanic regions and all that. But for the most part, I think I'm correct on everything I said. Uh, and as far as, like, other tribes that I mentioned, like the people of uh, Eli, the Jutham people, the Banu Amila people, all that, you know, how they could also be uh, – not distinguished, but, you know, considered a part of this whole uh, Banu Kabi tribe of people. 
Uh, when I was reading the book, I'm like, man, I don't want to be wrong. But not only do I think I'm correct, I was listening to something recently that I had downloaded, and it kind of put me in the mind of it. It ain't necessarily a pop reference as far as the movie, but it's like an old little political situation that happened in, like, 2001. And it was kind of similar to it. So I'm like, oh, let me go ahead and put that in there for your audio talking or audio recording. It's like, kind of Lisa Rice. So I'm thinking, right, as I'm putting this shit together, it just brought me into that whole little era. Now, this ain't mere connoting. That's not what the fuck I do. Like I say, whenever I feel like my brain, like I tailor my shit to my brain way. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to go beyond that fast. So my shit is really cool, comic, collective, whether it's just me or, or other forces. I'm not going to play. I'm just going to keep forward with what the fuck I do. Maintain my clarity. Uh, but anyway, I'm like, shit, 2001? Uh, I remember those talks, and they had the 9-11 commission going on. And so she had to face the Congress and all of this, right? So I had, you know, like I said, I uploaded a couple of those videos recently, yesterday. And I'm listening to it. I had, it was like two of them and then like an interview that she had on television outside of that context as well. But basically the same questions were brought up. And they were like, you know, wasn't you informed of some type of uh, briefing? In other words, like uh, it, written down, by the way, that, you know, you had these imminent threats, and then the title of it was Bin Laden Determined to Strike in America. And so she was going back and forth with some of the congressmen, and you could tell she was getting irritated because she made, like, a little slick comment toward one of them, like, you know, if you read the document, it's, it's basically a uh, history. You know, they wasn't talking about, like, anything that was – I guess she was saying, like, within this document itself, because I personally never read it, that shit as far as, like, current politics and geopolitical type stuff that comes later. I'm focusing on history right now. But she was basically telling the guy, based on her knowledge of the content within this packet, it didn't really point at anything that was, like, uh, guaranteed or inevitable as far as some type of major fucking strike here. She was basically trying to tell him, in the most nice, politically correct way, or words to where she won't get in trouble and they'll take a sound bite and play it over and over again and then make her seem like she's in that. She was basically telling him that everything that they had in there that she's privy to, that she read about or heard about, was nothing but cliche information. That's all it was. And so the guy asked her, he was like, well, you know, um, did the president meet with the head of the FBI or something like that, you know, after receiving this? And she was like, I don't know. So I'm, like, I'm listening to it. I'm like, okay, there's a lot of shit that she don't want to say because she don't want to get in trouble. Now, this, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's similar to my thought as I was reading and breaking this shit down. I'm like, okay, this is all based on information that's available in this book, even though I try my best to read in between the lines and then also read uh, through what I perceive to be BS, logically and as far as my senses is concerned. So I'm giving my best fucking honest, realistic, objective analysis based on the information presented to me. If I am wrong, then I am wrong based on lack of information. So when I was thinking about her, I'm like, okay. She was like, okay, well, yeah. But they kept, you know, making the point that overall, you know, no weapons were found there. And some of them was talking about, like, how could you say Saddam would be, um, 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 uh, 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 or it was a good thing to oust him from his position, and you can't really use that as a premise, et cetera. But the most important part as far as these uh, back-and-forth conversations that she had with them, basically quarrels, she kept making the point that they made a judgment as far as going into Iraq. And I'm not siding with the people. It's just the principle of what the fuck she said. She was like, they made a judgment based on the information that was put in front of them. And she was like, you know, what you know today uh, can affect what you do tomorrow, but what you know today can affect, cannot affect what you did yesterday. So she was trying to say, like, it doesn't go against her integrity. Like, she didn't lie or purposely try to manipulate information. She was basically operating on that which was provided for her, all right? 
that's the same principle that I operate on. But I also want to add this as a fun fact. And again, it's July 3rd, 9.40, 9.52 p.m. My shit well documented. Can't nobody steal none of this. It's off the head. I'm not looking at no notes. I had the opportunity to see in its entirety without any type of fucking sensationalism. The full interview around that time period when Bin Laden was interviewed. It's like a 50-minute interview, I think. I watched the whole fucking thing. And one thing that's very important that he said, because he makes no bounds, he doesn't like the West. I mean, he thinks the West is a, 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 a imperialistic group, collective group of white nations, to put it bluntly, all right, that wants to control the world and, 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 and dominate people. That's the essence of what he was saying. But the most important part to me is this. He said... He didn't personally, directly have a hand in the attacks of 9-11. He said that, you know, basically like uh, the atmosphere was not provided but like um, exacerbated. I guess you could say about Western policies or whatever, and that is what brought or engendered this action of somebody directly attacking America by flying planes into the building. Even though I got my own little theories about that too, but I'm just going to stick with the storyline as far as what he said. So he said he didn't personally have anything to do with it. And then he went further and started breaking down how it's going to hinder or hamper the fucking uh, uh, the economy, et cetera. He started giving his numbers and all of that, comparing it to other countries, blah, blah, blah. blah. But the most important part is that he said he did not have any hand in that, he did not set it up or anything like that. Now, this guy is considered an international terrorist, all right? He was also a rich person. Nobody was funding him but himself. He had help from other groups, obviously, but for the most part, his mouth was not bound by anything. So, <laughs> being that he was considered an international terrorist, I feel like if he really had a direct hand in that, he would have just said it, yeah. My people put this, we set this all up, we have sales in your country, et cetera. He didn't say that. Now, Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State. I honestly believe she had access to the fucking energy. But she's the Secretary of State. When they was questioning her about this, I guarantee she wanted to say that. You know what I'm saying? If not, I guess she didn't think about it. But in my mind, the way I'm breaking it down, I'm thinking, like, okay, she's getting a little irritated, but at the same time, her hands are tied, so she can't really completely say everything she wants to fucking say. But I bet you, you know what I'm saying, in her head, I'm going to say more than likely, she was thinking, like, man, <laughs> to put it in simple language, look, look, the Latin didn't have a hand in this. All right? <laughs> I guarantee she wanted to fucking say that. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, that's just, uh, 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 that's just a, uh, a, a, a fun note, you know what I'm saying? And also because they was going into Afghanistan and all that, you know, I 